This video is about mechanical nerve injuries. And mainly what we're talking about would be entrapment syndromes, where compression of nerve fibers or nearby uh, blood vessels uh, creates motor and sensory abnormalities. So there's a few sites throughout our body uh, they contain tiny spaces that nerve fibers have to pass through and those are potential sites of compression. We're going to spend most of the time talking about carpal tunnel syndrome um, but the, the same principles apply to pretty much any of the disorders uh, that we're going to talk about. So any of the entrapment disorders are going to follow the same sequence of events. Something causes compression of the nerve. That compression causes uh, damage that damage leads to inflammation, that inflammation leads to further compression, leads to further damage, etc., etc. So symptoms will tend to worsen over time uh, unless they're treated early. And that treatment can come in the form of conservative treatment, uh, where it might be physical therapy or the use of NSAIDs or, or painkillers or some sort of uh, supportive device uh, to make sure that uh, we, we hold our, our joints at the proper angle. Uh, to prevent further um, entrapment and compression or uh, when the symptoms are more severe or unable to be managed with conservative treatment we turn to surgery. So that's basically the story for all of these. Um, what we have are just different sites. So slightly different nerves are going to be involved and that's going to affect different areas of the body but the story is still the same. Compress the nerve or the blood vessels and you kick off this this uh, positive feedback loop of compression, damage, inflammation. Compression, damage, inflammation. <clears throat> so, uh, repetitive movements or um, potentially autoimmune diseases, bony outgrowths, tumor growths, musculoskeletal abnormalities, all these can cause nerve compression, um, leading to mechanical nerve injury. We're going to be talking about carpal tunnel for uh, most of this talk because it's very common. Uh, this is the most common upper limb um, neuropathy here. The annual incidence is going to range somewhere between 250 and 360 per 100,000 people. Uh, you'll see this is more common in females than males, so you can have a look at the data here. Uh, here we're, we're plotting from 1993 on up to about uh, 2014. Uh, you can see that there's an increase uh, around the turn of the century and uh, regardless of where we look it's about two to two and a half uh, times more common in females than males. Uh, the major risk factor here is repetitive use and, and likely that uptick in risk has to do with the uh, increase in computer use. So computers are far more common, uh, many jobs involve uh, daily, uh, if not constant, use of uh, computers, and of course we interface using a keyboard. Now, of course, we're supposed to keep our wrists elevated and type like this, and no one does. We all rest our wrists down and type as such. Now, by bending your wrist when you type like that, you're putting a little extra pressure uh, on, on the uh, median nerve uh, running through the carpal tunnel there because when you bend your wrist the nerve has to move as well so it's going to kind of glide through that carpal tunnel. So repetitive use, uh, particularly with uh, incorrect uh, posture at joints, that's going to increase the risk of causing uh, damage, then inflammation, then compression, and you get that vicious cycle. Uh, the use of vibrating tools can also uh, lead to this as your your hands are, are shaking there back and forth. Uh, that can then lead to irritation of the, the carpal tunnel as well. But there's a laundry list uh, of potential risk factors and it all kind of revolves around um, nerve injury or inflammation, swelling, things of that nature. So diabetes is of course a, a risk factor here. Uh, it, just like in the last lecture it's still true that we get that glove and stocking distribution and in order to get the gloves, well, that median nerve has to move through the carpal tunnel. We got a couple other options, um, but the, the median nerve is a major nerve that innervates the hands. It's going to hit our first three uh, digits there and these are fairly important. 
Uh, of course, osteoarthritis is another risk factor. Um, if you have any sort of uh, swelling or growth inside the carpal tunnel, that's going to lead to compression. The clinical presentation here um, first comes on as pain in the wrist and the first three digits. Uh, of course, that's going to be uh, the part of the hand that's innervated uh, by the median nerve. And the median nerve is going to pass through the carpal tunnel. So that's what we're doing here. We're compressing the median nerve. When we do that, that's going to lead to um, pain. It can, it can lead to a little bit of uh, a numbness in the fingers so that, that that loss of sensation can lead to a bit of clumsiness uh, causing us to drop um, things that we're, we're holding. And as the disease uh, progresses, if we actually have loss of axons, so loss of motor neurons that innervate the muscles there in the hand, you can see muscular wasting. Uh, this won't be the first sign though. The first thing we're going to have is pain. Pain is the first thing to come on. Uh, those smaller non-myelinated fibers are going to be the, the more excitable ones and they're going to be the first to be stimulated with a little bit of compression. As the compression increases, then we're going to progress um, and, and have axonomesis and the loss of nerve fibers. When we lose the, the motor neurons, we lose the muscles. Hopefully we remember something about use it or lose it and those neurotrophic factors it goes both ways, so the motor neuron and the muscle keep each other alive uh, when they're used. So by spitting out acetylcholine and stimulating the muscle, we get a nice feedback loop here, so they keep each other alive with trophic factors. When we have compression of the axon, let's say in our carpal tunnel here, so this is a, a motor neuron running in the, the median nerve. That compression, if it leads to the loss of axons, that denervation of the muscle is going to lead to wasting. And this is what we see with lower motor neuron damage. This is going to be a sign that we have more severe damage than just simple compression and demyelination. This is going to be suggestive of axon loss. As far as diagnosing uh, carpal tunnel syndrome, uh, there are a few provocative tests that you can do. Uh, there's the, the Fallon test there. I think there's a reverse Fallon test as well. So you hold your, your hand like this for uh, a, a minute or so and see if there's any pain. Um, and it works in some cases very well. In other cases, flip a coin. Uh, you can use imaging to look for uh, swelling of the nerve or, or uh, a decrease in the size of the carpal tunnel, but the gold standard is just going to be nerve conduction velocity studies. So we can stimulate our uh, median nerve at different points, and then we can, we can measure then activity in the distribution of the median nerve. By knowing when we stimulate, and how far away we're recording, we can then calculate the conduction velocity. So you can, you can see them doing that in these data here. So by stimulating at different points of a different distance, we know how far between our stimulator and our recording electrodes. We just see how long it takes for us to get that action potential. How long does it take for stimulation of the nerve to cause muscle activity? Distance over time will give us our conduction velocity. Now we should remember that different nerves uh, are going to have different conduction velocities uh, depending on the types of axons that make them up and when we're looking at a motor response these should be the fastest uh, nerve fibers that we have because they're large and they're myelinated. Whenever we start to lose that myelin we're going to have slowed conduction velocity. And that's what we're looking for. That's our gold standard. So when the conduction velocity is going to drop uh, down below that uh, roughly 70 meters per second or so and dip below 50, once you have uh, less than uh, 50 meters per second, that's the general cutoff for saying that we have slowed conduction, uh, at least for the, the median nerve here. So, 
slowing of conduction velocity is suggestive of demyelination. The loss of myelin. That's of course going to be the first thing that occurs whenever we have pressure. The reason that we have pressure is because we're passing through a confined space. So that carpal tunnel in your wrist is going to be surrounded by bones and ligaments. And what we're going to be doing is passing through a few tendons and that median nerve. So we have a few different fibers running in a confined space. So it, it's similar to our discussion of inflammation in the central nervous system. Because we have that skull encasing our brain, inflammation sucks. Same thing is true here. So at the carpal tunnel, inflammation sucks because we have a very tight space. Uh, we don't have room to swell. And this is an inelastic structure. So when we have pressure on a nerve fiber, the first thing to go is, of course, the myelin sheath. So myelin is there to act as uh, not only an insulator and to increase conduction velocity and to uh, cut down on the ATP cost, it's also a cushion. So it's a big fluffy uh, case that's there to take damage because we can renew myelin very easily uh, in comparison with regrowing an axon which can be difficult to impossible depending on the type of injury. So the first thing that happens with pressure, uh, we're going to get that neuropraxia. So demyelination, also called neuropraxia, same thing. Of course, we have to call everything 20 different terms. Uh, that's to help it make sense, I'm sure. So with that pressure, the first thing we get is demyelination. And when we lose the myelin sheath, remember, we run into a big issue here of no ion channels. No ion channels, no conduction. As those ion channels move in, we have slowed conduction because we'll have demyelinated regions of the axon. If we continue to place the pressure on the nerve, and we've had that initial neuropraxia, if we're still putting pressure on those axons and they're no longer surrounded uh, by myelin there, the next thing to happen is of course the loss of axons. So the neuropraxia will be sufficient to give us our pain and paresthesia. But the axonomesis is going to be necessary for atrophy of the muscles. Uh, we'll also get weakness. Atrophy is going to require the loss of axons. So this could be because of pressure on the axons themselves or nearby vasculature. So we're running, of course we have to have blood supply all along that nerve because all along the nerve we're using ATP. We need glucose and oxygen to replenish that ATP. Even though we're myelinated and we're, we're efficient with our ATP use, we still need to make more of it. Whenever we compress the vasculature, that can also lead to nerve damage. So the little capillaries uh, that are keeping the median nerve alive there, when they get compressed and we lose blood flow to the median nerve, this exacerbates the damage. And this is a common thing. You can compress the nerve or you can compress the blood vessels. And either way, you're going to damage the nerve. <coughs> Now, um, we, we have here a vicious uh, cycle of injury. So let's say you're, you're typing away and that, that chronic use is going to lead to some inflammation. You get a little bit of swelling, you get a little bit of pressure, you get a little bit of injury. That injury, of course, stimulates inflammation, which leads to a little more pressure, a little more injury. So if you don't control the underlying cause of the inflammation, swelling, and injury, this is going to spiral out of control. So if you don't take a break, 
from typing. Let your muscles rest. Let the, the swelling go back down. If you're doing that day in, day out, or if you have some sort of um, underlying disease that's causing compression there and that's not treated, the symptoms are only going to get worse. You're going to go from that pain, paresthesia, and you're going to start to see um, muscle atrophy. <clears throat> Another part of the problem is the formation of scar tissue. So the median nerve is going to respond to damage as well, and the mesoneurium is going to form uh, little bits of scar tissue and cause it to stick in the carpal tunnel, so that when you're moving your wrist, this can then exacerbate um, the symptoms, because normally your median nerve is able to glide as we stretch. Right now, the, the median nerve is uh, uh, not spanning as great a distance as it is when I move my wrist, either uh, flexing or extending, that's going to cause the median nerve to get pulled through the carpal tunnel a little bit. It moves about a centimeter or so, but it needs to be flexible and it needs to be able to move. With injury and the formation of scar tissue, the median nerve sticks in place so that as I'm flexing, instead of gliding along, it gets pulled. And pulling on the nerve uh, is of course going to damage the nerve, leading to inflammation, pressure and further injury. So it's a vicious cycle. That means uh, it's important to treat this early on before we uh, spiral out of control and have axon loss, muscle atrophy. So treatment needs to be quick. And this is true really for any kind of nerve injury. You want to control the underlying cause of injury and allow as much healing to take place as possible. And ideally, you just have to remyelinate. That's the simplest fix. Regrowing the axon is possible, but it can be difficult. So we want to stop it uh, at the level of neuropraxia, if possible, and that needs to be early. The progression is, of course, uh, going to depend on the underlying cause. So if it's just simply taking a break from typing, fairly easy to treat. Um, uh, other, other problems like uh, osteoarthritis, well, that can be a more elaborate treatment. And as far as treatments go, the, the first thing to do is conservative treatment with ergonomic modifications. So you could wear a, you know, a brace, for example. You can try to mentally make yourself type with good form, but no one does that. Um, if there's diabetes, of course, controlling that is important. Uh, exercise is always good. Uh, steroids are helpful, and they do provide uh, relief of symptoms. Uh, the data here are showing us that. So on top, that's just showing us steroid injection versus placebo and we can see uh, relief of symptoms. You can uh, have steroid injections or you can use NSAIDs as well as uh, splints. Those are compared on the bottom and you can see they're pretty much the same. If symptoms aren't able to be controlled after about a year of this conservative treatment and you confirm the involvement of the median nerve uh, with conduction velocity studies, then surgery uh, is the next uh, step and the outcomes there are pretty darn good. Now all the other uh, nerve entrapment syndromes are going to have the exact same story just in a different location. Uh, so for example thoracic outlet syndrome. Uh, this is a bit of a mystery. We know it has something to do with the thoracic outlet and it creates some highly variable uh, syndrome of poorly defined uh, uh, sensory symptoms somewhere from the, the neck down to the arm, there can be weakness, there can be atrophy, it's highly variable. Also variable would be the diagnosis. It depends on who you see. If you go see a surgeon, well, you're about a hundred times more likely to have thoracic outlet syndrome than if you went to see a neurologist. And depending on your insurance, that can increase or decrease your likelihood of having thoracic outlet syndrome as well, because one of the treatments is, of course, surgery. Now, there can be very clear reasons to have surgery, for example, the presence of a cervical rib. Um, uh, which, which can, of course, um, put pressure in the thoracic outlet there. That makes sense to treat uh, surgically, but not every case is going to have that clear cause. So there could be uh, skeletal abnormalities, there could be uh, muscular abnormalities, uh, you know, hypertrophy of muscles uh, can lead to compression, uh, the, the kind of hyper abduction at the shoulder can lead to compression. Uh, of, of the, the thoracic outlet. 
And you can compress the nerve fibers or you can compress the blood vessels and either one is going to cause uh, nerve damage. When you compress the blood vessels or uh, some of the autonomic fibers there, you can see these, um, these changes in, the, in blood flow in the fingertips. So it causes the Renaud uh, phenomenon there where early on they turn white um, as you have loss of blood flow and then you see them turn blue, they'll then turn red as blood flow returns. Uh, this can be caused by compression of blood vessels uh, or autonomic fibers. Um, but it's the same story. <clears throat> when you have compression on the nerve or the blood vessels, you then create some sort of sensory and motor abnormalities. They're highly variable for, for thoracic outlet syndrome. Uh, tardy ulnar palsy here, we're going to affect the uh, ulnar nerve. So that's going to be passing. Uh, down here at the elbow there, and repeated injury is going to be the big risk factor here. Uh, so when we have repeated injury uh, causing uh, the formation of calluses or, or causing the movement of bones there, that can then put pressure on the ulnar nerve. Damage to the radial nerve most commonly happens uh, by sleeping on uh, your, your arm there incorrectly, so they, we'll call it uh, Saturday night uh, palsy. Uh, where you fall asleep on a chair and uh, the chair puts pressure on the radial nerve, so you'll get a short-lived uh, motor weakness and sensory loss along the distribution of the radial nerve. So in both cases, whether it's uh, ulnar palsy or radial nerve palsy, you're going to have sensory loss in the hand. Of course, the, the ulnar nerve is going to hit more the outside here on digits four and five, uh, and the radial nerve is going to hit kind of the back of the hand along digits one, two, and three. You'll also see some wrist drop uh, with uh, radial nerve palsy. Now, a unique entity here is Bell's palsy because this involves a cranial nerve, and here we're dealing with the, the face. But this is a common entrapment syndrome that occurs later on in life. Um, the mechanism is unclear, but the thinking is that it's reactivation of a virus leading to an inflammatory response and compression of the facial nerve. Now, this can be distinguished from uh, a stroke in terms of how the face is affected. So here we're talking about damage to the uh, facial nerve. That would be, of course, the lower motor neurons. A stroke is more commonly going to affect the upper motor neurons. So the innervation of the facial nuclei, so that's our seventh cranial nerve, so we're, we're down here in the pons. And we're going to separate uh, upper and lower face. Here's our overlying motor cortex. We're going to have bilateral innervation for the upper face. So both sides of the cortex are going to hit the upper, but the lower face is going to only receive contralateral innervation. From here, we're going to have ipsilateral innervation of the face. So we can think of it in different quadrants. Left, right, and then lower, upper. Whenever we have uh, Bell's palsy, and we have compression of the facial nerve here, we're going to be affecting upper and lower uh, quadrants of the face on one side. So if we have compression of the facial nerve here for the left, we're going to see droop in the upper and lower face. So if you look at this cartoon here on the bottom, there we're seeing Bell's palsy. You don't see this with stroke. So for example, if we have stroke causing an upper motor neuron lesion, the lower uh, facial lower motor neurons are of course going to be denervated and we'll see weakness in the lower quadrant. However, the upper quadrant of the face, although it's lost input from the contralateral motor cortex, it still has a backup from the ipsilateral cortex. So we won't see drooping of the upper quadrant of the face there. And the reason that the facial nerve is fairly easy to compress is because of this winding path uh, that it takes through the temporal bone there. 
So it has a very long path uh, through the skull, and as such, it has a, a larger number of sites where it can be compressed. Same story though. You have inflammation, most likely due to a viral uh, reactivation. That inflammation uh, causes swelling, puts pressure on the nerve, and that pressure causes damage. Uh, Bell's palsy usually resolves on its own. Uh, again, you're just going to have to have remyelination uh, to restore function of the facial nerve. All right, we got a few uh, questions here to go over. Uh, we'll have one final lecture on non-mechanical uh, uh, peripheral nerve injuries, and that'll be it. Uh, fill out the questions box if anything is unclear, or send me an email, and we'll go through these uh, later on this week. See you later.